when I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. Friends, welcome. Thank you for joining us for this service of worship. Yeah, this has been a strange time in the life of our community and in our world. It's a trying time. It's an uncertain time. It's a confusing time in many ways. And so right now we come. We come away from what's happening in our world. We come to lift our eyes, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to remember the bigger story that he is writing, to remember who he is, that we serve a God of great faithfulness, a God who is sovereign, a God whose plans and purposes are always taking shape, even when we cannot see it. And we need to come and have this time in worship and step back and remember who we belong to, that he is worthy of our trust and worthy of our praise. And so we come this morning to remember again the good news. As I was thinking through our sermon series for this summer on the topic of good news, I was in conversation with my wife, Sarah, as I often am. And if you know Sarah, you know that she has uh, the gift of remarkable insight into Scripture. And as we were talking through this topic of good news she reminded me of the story of Hagar in the book of Genesis. Not a very well-known story, but a powerful story. And as she began to share with me her insights as to the ways that the story of Hagar is a story of good news, I, I, I was impressed with the power of that story. And I said to Sarah, I think that's a sermon, and I think you need to be the one to preach it. So this morning, Sarah is going to open up Genesis for us and read for us and unpack that story of Hagar and help us see the ways in which even in those early chapters of Genesis, God already was displaying his character and his goodness 
in the life of this unknown individual who comes now to us as an important figure in Scripture, uh, the young woman Hagar. So I hope you will open up Scripture with us this morning. I hope you will set aside this time and engage in mind, in heart, in spirit, in this time of worship. As we begin, will you join me in our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 69. I will praise my God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Let the oppressed see it and be glad. All you who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy. He does not despise his own who are in bondage. Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness, morning, 
Friends, we're going to take a moment now and share in a time of confession, enjoying together the opportunity to unburden ourselves before God, to lay down our sins, knowing that his mercy is greater than our sin. So will you join me in our prayer of confession? O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Open our eyes, soften our hearts. Give us contrite spirits that we might humble ourselves before you and so be lifted up. Amen. I encourage you right where you are to take a moment in quiet before God and lay down your sins and receive his grace. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. With compassion, I will gather you, says the Lord. With everlasting love, I will show you mercy, says your Redeemer. Hallelujah. Praise God for his grace. The Bible is everybody's story. It is by many different people. It is about many different people. And it is for all kinds of different people. We're going to look for good news in the story of Hagar today. And as we look at this multi-layered story with multiple characters and multiple perspectives, we are going to find good news for all kinds of people. I have the very great privilege of speaking to you and being on vacation at the same time. It's really awesome, you should try it. Many of you know Don Gissel, who's such a beloved member of our church and of our choir. And Don often invites us to use his house. And I know many of you have been to his house here in Waldport, also down at the Oregon coast. Um, and Don, I know that you've given this house to be used for many holy purposes, but I am guessing that this is the first time that anyone has ever sat in your house and preach to the entire congregation of Oak Hills at the same time. So thank you. You didn't even know that I was going to do this today, but thank you. One of the things I like most about the story of Hagar is that in it, the Bible's commitment to multiple perspectives is so clearly seen. The Bible is not a book in which one person, one perspective, one set of eyes is elevated and everyone else is flattened. No, the Bible says, because God says, that each person whose story is found in these pages is worthy of dignity of having their story told. So today, with the story of Hagar, we have three main characters. Abraham, or in this reading, Abram. Sarah, or in this reading, she's known as Sarai. And Hagar. And Abraham, as we know, is the patriarch the founder of the faith, the guy who walks with God. And so we might expect that he would always be found to be in the right. But that's not the case in this story. There's also Sarah, his wife, mother of nations, the foremother of the entire family of God on earth. Now, I like Sarah a lot because I share her name. But Sarah, too, is not found to be in the right in this story. No, in this story, it's Hagar, the foreign slave whose perspective is elevated. Hagar, the foreign slave woman whose viewpoint is found to be the clearest because in this story, it's Hagar who sees God. I'm going to read to you from Genesis 16, Verses 1 to 13. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. 
So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility toward his brothers. Then Hagar gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, she said. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Let's pray. Help us, Lord to hear what your scriptures are saying to us. Help us to see the dignity of all people. Help us to listen. Help us to put down our pride and to be humble in your sight. Amen. So this is kind of a he said, she said with multiple characters, multiple perspectives. So the first thing we need to get clear on is what happened. What are the facts of the matter? Abraham is married to Sarah. They want a child. And so far, they don't have one. But God promised them a child. And so Sarah starts to wonder whether they've gotten it wrong or whether they're just confused about the method. Maybe the promised child was supposed to come from Abraham, but not from Sarah. And maybe this is the first sin in this story, Sarah's doubt. She begins to question God's word, to question God's timing, to question God's methods. She begins to wonder whether God maybe needs just a little help from her. Well, small sins lead to bigger sins. And from that first sin of doubt comes a much graver situation. And this is what we need to get clear on. When Sarah puts her slave Hagar into Abraham's arms, this is an act of non-consensual sex. And therefore, by our modern definition, it is an act of rape. Now, to be clear, this is not rape by the definition of Abraham's culture. Abraham did not think that he was raping his slave. In his culture, heads of households had the absolute right to do what he did in the service of increasing their family line. I don't think that either Abraham or Sarah had malicious intent right here at the top of the story. But sometimes, even when something is culturally acceptable, even when we have good intentions, it can still have a harmful effect. 
And that's what happened here. From Abraham and Sarah's perspective, their actions made sense. They wanted a baby, so they're going to use this person over here to get a baby. But the key word is used. They saw Hagar not as a person, but as a tool, something to be used. From Hagar's perspective, as people always feel when they get used, this was painful. It was a violation. And so it should not surprise us when Hagar begins to, as the text says, despise her mistress. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what words or actions this despising took the shape of. But to me, I read this as a normal human emotion as a reaction to violence. Her will was discounted. Her body was used. Of course, she got mad. And maybe it's Sarah's guilt Maybe she knows deep down that she is responsible for the way Hagar feels. So maybe it's her guilt that causes her to say, whoa, that's not okay. I don't want to be reminded by you that I wronged you. So she talks to Abraham. He washes his hands of the whole thing. And Sarah mistreats Hagar. We're not told what mistreats means, but probably it means more violence. So here's Hagar. She's been raped. She's probably been beaten. And so she runs. And I think it's important for us to establish these facts so that we can clearly see that Hagar is the victim here, right? Despite the fact that she despises her mistress, whatever that means, She got the short end of the stick in this story. And Abraham and Sarah, for all that their faith is held up as an example throughout the rest of the Bible, and rightly so, because they are amazing people. But in this story, they are the victimizers. They are the ones who held all the power over this young girl, and they exercise that power in ways that completely ignore her humanity. So there's good news in this story. It's not, I mean, it's a bad situation, but there is good news. There is definitely good news for Hagar. And I think if we look closely, if they will receive it, there's also good news for Abraham and Sarah. First of all, the good news for Hagar. Hagar is a foreigner. She is a slave. She is a woman. She is young. She is pregnant. She has been raped. She has been beaten. By all accounts in that society, it would seem that Hagar is the one in the story who doesn't matter. Abraham and Sarah have consistently shown that they think She doesn't matter. And yet, she is the one to whom God shows up. This is good news. The good news here is that God is not just a God of the powerful. God is a God who is constantly seeking everyone's perspective even when it flies in the face of somebody whom God has already clearly chosen. God loves Abraham. God has made a promise to Abraham, and he's going to keep that promise. Abraham walks with God. But when Abraham messes up and acts violently toward another human being, God loves that person too. God is not limited in whom he loves. God does not take sides. God is constantly looking for people on the outside, even if they've been put there 
by people whom God especially loves and chooses. The good news for you and me is that whenever we have been victimized, whenever we've been hurt, whenever we've been excluded, whenever we've been on the outside, whenever we've been pushed away, whenever we've been ignored by the powerful of this world, God sees us there. Whenever you have been at your weakest, your lowest, your smallest, your least powerful, your least attractive, if you are in the desert this morning and you feel all alone, God sees you. God sees you. And he has a plan for you. He is not going to leave you out in the cold. So that's the first good news. That God sees Hagar. That God sees and loves and values all those who, like Hagar, have been victimized. And all of us can put ourselves into the position of Hagar sometimes because all of us have been hurt. But what about when we realize that we are more like Abraham and Sarah? What about when we realize that we are not a victim, but a victimizer? Now, maybe we haven't outright raped or beaten anybody. But maybe like Abraham and Sarah, we have done things that were culturally acceptable. Maybe we even had good intentions but maybe we harmed others anyway. What is the good news then? This summer has been eye-opening for some of us in this country who are white. Some white people have been aware for a long time of the evils of the racism that is still with us in this country, but some of us are maybe just waking up for the first time. If you watched the video of the police officer with his knee on the neck of George Floyd, if you've educated yourself about statistics, about inherited wealth and real estate laws and prison populations, differences that extend to this day between the way we treat black people and the way we treat white people in this country, Some of us are just starting to ask ourselves, where am I in this system? What have I done maybe to contribute to or maybe to profit from or maybe just to turn a blind eye to all of this mess? And so the question is, what is the good news for the victimizers. Now, some of you maybe aren't ready to ask these questions, and I get that. Some people say, how can you say such bad things about America? America is the land of the free and the home of the brave. How can you hate this country like that? Well, I wanna tell you a little story about something that happened to us last week, right before we went on vacation. This summer, as some of you know, we are remodeling our kitchen. It was obvious when we bought our 1932 house that the kitchen was in bad shape. (laughs) This is not a we're tired of last year's models kind of remodel. This is a this kitchen has been here longer than both of our ages combined and it is just no longer functional kind of remodel. So this summer, we decided to take the plunge We refinanced and we're getting into it. So there was one corner of the kitchen that was suspect. When you stepped there, you could just feel the floor kind of sag. I mean, it was squishy in a way that you just don't want floors to be. So I put the dog food bowl there and just, we didn't walk on it and it was fine. But last week, 
our contractor peeled off the four different layers of vinyl floor and the one underlayment and then the original fur floor that had been completely glued and was totally unsalvageable. And he got down to the bones and then he was ready to start pulling at the dry rot. Well, he started pulling. There was dry rot over here and it extended over here and it spread to over there. And pretty soon he realized there was dry rot everywhere. The whole back wall of our kitchen was rotten, crumbling to dust. Now, I want to ask you, would we have been loving our kitchen if we told our contractor, you know what, we don't really care. Let's just put the wall back up, put a new floor on, pretend that it's not rotten, pretend that the dry rot just doesn't exist. Would that be the loving thing to do? No. That is not the response of love. That is the response of hatred. If you hate something, you just let it keep rotting. Just let it fall down. If you love it, you do the work. We love our house. I love our house. So I am thrilled that we are finally going to start clearing out the rot and rebuilding it from the inside out. Brothers and sisters, our country is rotten. This summer, the walls have come down and the rot of racism that has been there all along has been exposed even more than it already was exposed. Our country is rotting from the inside out because for too long, people whose skin looked like mine did violence to people whose skin looked different and told themselves that they had been chosen by God so they were incapable of doing wrong, which is a lie. And other people whose skin looked like mine, sometimes even including me, did nothing. It is not hatred of America to face those facts. It is love. And yes, there are times when people who have been hurt get angry. Hagar despised her mistress. But it is normal to get angry when you have been hurt. And we cannot focus our attention on the visible expression of the anger to the exclusion of the thing that caused the anger in the first place. Hagar despised her mistress. Why? Because her mistress sold her out to her master to be raped. People are downtown burning buildings. Why? Because for too long, we have valued our property over our people. Does that mean burning buildings is okay? No, but don't get distracted. Don't focus on the wrong thing. People are angry for a reason, and our job is to ask why. The good news in this story for the victimizer, the good news for Abraham and Sarah, comes in the form of an opportunity. Not only does God see Hagar, but here's something incredible. Hagar sees and names God. Hagar, the foreign slave woman, is the first person in the Bible to give a new name 
to God. You are the God who sees me. The good news that's a little bit harder to spot in this story is that Hagar went back and she told this story to someone in Abraham and Sarah's community. I don't know if it was Abraham and Sarah themselves, but maybe. And they listened. Someone in that tent camp listened. We know that because the story is here in our Bible. If Hagar had not gone back, if she had not spoken up, if she had not told her story, we wouldn't know that one of the names of God is the one who sees me. We wouldn't know this part of who God is if someone hadn't listened. The good news for us today is that we too can begin to listen. We can begin to ask, why are you angry? And be humble enough to hear the answer. Because God is showing up to black and brown people in ways that white people cannot see or understand unless we listen to what they have to tell us. God is showing up to disabled people and elderly people and poor people and homeless people and incarcerated people and people who are ravaged by drugs and people who have been sex trafficked and people we might walk right past if we saw them on the road. God is showing up in their lives. He sees them and they are seeing him. And we will never know the whole truth about who God is unless we humble ourselves and listen to them. The good news is that we can. If you're looking for a place to start, I highly recommend a book called Hear Us, Emmanuel. It is a collection of essays written by black and brown and white men and women in the Presbyterian Church of America, which is our sister denomination, even if people on both sides of that split of the family tree would prefer not to remember that it is. The essays are all about what it's like to be a person of color in church. And I am telling you, we need to listen to these stories. Sometimes they will convict us because maybe we have done or said or thought some things that are not okay. And we need to recognize that. But sometimes we need to listen just because people who are different from us are encountering God. And if we want to know the full truth about who God is, we have to listen to them. Friends, it is good news that God created many different kinds of people. It is good news that if other people have hurt you because you are different from them, God sees you. And it is good news that if you are part of the majority, if you and I have taken part in oppression and in marginalizing those who are different, we can begin right now to listen. God be with you. Hey, join me in prayer. God, we praise you that you are a God who sees, that you see those who no one else sees. Lord, that your eye is on the sparrow, that you draw near to the brokenhearted, that you have compassion on the lonely. 
the orphan and the widow, those who have been mistreated. And Lord, sometimes we find ourselves in that place, alone, lost, forgotten, mistreated. And we praise you that you come to us in those places and you show us your mercy and you bless us with the fullness of your presence. But this morning, God, we acknowledge that there are times when we are not the victims, when we are the ones who have victimized others. When we have abused our positions of power and influence and caused harm to others. Or maybe just participated in a system, in a society that victimizes others and rather than work for change, we've been apathetic. But Lord, we thank you that your good news is for both the oppressed and the oppressors that you show grace where there is sin, that you invite all of us to open our hearts, to grow, to be renewed by your spirit. And so we open ourselves to you, O oh God, that your grace might take shape in our hearts. We thank you that you move outside the lines, that the boxes we try to fit you in do not apply you are a great God, majestic and almighty, sovereign, tender in your love for us. And so we hold up to you this broken world and our own broken hearts, the sin that we need to release, and the hope we have for a different kind of world. Would you be about the work of renewal, O oh God? in our world, in our community, in our government, in our culture, and in our own hearts. We need you. We call out for the movement of your Holy Spirit in our midst. Thank you that we can come to you, that you receive us, you're so full of grace and loving kindness, O oh God. And so we turn to you. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Hear us now as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Salvation. 
You know, the world would have forgotten Hagar, and yet we know her name today. Why is that? It's because God did not forget Hagar. This person that no one else saw, God saw. God sees those who no one else sees. He sees you. He sees me. And he is at work outside the lines working all things together for good, making all things new. May we be lifted up in the good news of the God who sees. And may we be shaped to be his people, brothers and sisters. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.